as Tony and Jesse can attest, I often compare life to a football game where instead of four 15-minute periods, you have four 20-year periods. At the end of the first one, you're largely operating under your parents' game plan with a little input from you. And then as you begin to the second quarter, you start to take control at the other end of the field as the adult. Halftime comes and you reassess. Some people go through what is called a midlife crisis. Others change the course dramatically. Or others simply do better or more of what they had been doing. By the time the fourth quarter run, rolls around, it's much more easy to assess without illusion or delusion the success or failure of your game plan and your performance against it. So with that context in mind, the title of my speech tonight is An Objectivist's Journey, 73 Years in the Making. I was born at Fitzsimmons uh, in Denver. That's because my dad was a ski instructor in the 10th Mountain Division during World War II. The war, my mother lived in a, a, a small apartment on Lafayette Street. The war ended, we moved back to my parents' roots in Rhode Island. My father was a tool and die maker. My mother was a seamstress in a textile mill. I grew up in that environment. Uh, my grandmother took care of me while both worked before there was such a thing as daycare. Uh, it became politically expedient, daycare. I just simply stayed with my grandmother while they worked. Now, the point of citing this, and I've examined throughout the course of my life, and I cannot determine where this came from specifically, but I generally grew up with a disrespect and contempt for authority. Amen, brother. All authority, not just my parents, their friends, my teachers, police. I respected virtually no one. And of course, I acted that way. I was a royal pain in the ass. So much so that partway through my second year in the 10th grade, I was expelled from school <coughs> and told not to return. Now, I was close to being 16, so I could do that. I, I could avoid school and did. Now, why was I expelled? Well, I was expelled for the typical reasons of a hell-raising kid. There were fights, smoking in the restroom, firecrackers put in places you shouldn't put them in school. <laughs> but the final thing that happened was really no big deal. But it was the final straw on part on top of all the others. Now, I'm going to go into that because it's humorous. And it'll give you an example of the kind of kid I was. I had a good friend. His name was Joey. Now that we have social media, I'll use his name Joey. That's, a, that's not his name, but <laughs> I'll use it. For those of you old enough, Joey looked just like Fabian. How many know who Fabian is? Joey looked just like him. He wore his hair just like him to accentuate that fact. Well, Joey's other virtue was he was an artist. And Joey could, with a pencil or a paintbrush, he could depict reality as no one I had ever seen. And Joey had my respect, and he was known for that. Well, Joey was also a sculptor. And one day at lunch, Joey had a little box with him. I said, what's that, Joe? He said, oh, it's something I made in crafts. And he opened it up. It was the most eloquent example of that part of the male anatomy that deserves so much attention. <laughs> I mean, the proportions. Good size, but not pretentious. So I said, Joey, meet me between classes. I got an idea. Now, in our school, the main entrance was right next to the boys' bathroom, 
There was a phone booth, a drinking fountain, and the girls' bathroom. Most of the students passed by this between classes. So Joey met me, and with Joey providing cover, we moved over to the drinking fountain, whereupon I took his creation and plopped it down on the drinking fountain. And Joey providing cover, we moved back. And it wasn't too long. Suddenly there was a scream. And the, the sound of books crashing to the floor. And some girl had decided she wanted a drink of water and had walked over to that drinking fountain and, of course, was startled. Well, when she screamed, the entire crowd of people passing by turned. And of course, Joey and I knew what was going on. And about that time, a teacher came by, a man teacher. And he wanted to know what was going on, so he noticed and walked over there. He saw that, and he walked over there and took it off and put it under his coat and left. Well, someone ratted me out, and they knew who had done it. So I was called into the office and expelled from school. I'll give you an example of one of my reasons why I had developed such a disrespect for authority. When my mother came to school to once again meet with the principal, this, she usually met with the vice principal. This time it was the principal. And uh, we went into the office and I was there. And uh, my mother immediately started on her normal routine. You know, David is really a good boy, Mr. Bennett, and so forth. And this is a quote from one of our public officials, principal of a school. Dave is really a good boy, Mr. Bennett. Well, Mrs. Walden, Walden, that's what all mothers say when they're taking their son to the electric chair. That's the kind of administrators we have in public education. Anyway, I went into the job market. Now, as efficacious as I thought my, my work habits were, you can imagine what my attitude was. So I was about as successful in the job market as I was in school. So after a year and a half of trying this job and that job, and I tried a lot of different things, it was decided that the best thing that I could do would be to go into service. Now, for those of you that, that understand that I started with a disrespect and contempt for authority, the idea of me going into the military where the entire enterprise operates under authority, you can imagine what I was greeted with. Well, I won't dwell on it. I successfully completed four years and was honorably discharged, and I consider it a major accomplishment. <laughs> but there were three things that happened during those four years that were to set both the near-term and the long-term course of my life. The first was the Air Force sent me to school for 42 weeks here in Denver at Lowry, electronics school. I guess I had tested well on the test, so they sent me to school for 42 weeks. So I learned electronics and a system that's on bombers uh, that I had to maintain. They sent me to Shaw Air Force Base in Sumter, South Carolina, where I began work, and put me on third shift. So having nothing to do during the day before I would go to work, I would go to the service club on base, and they had a piano there. And I had always loved music, so I would go to the piano and I'd start picking out melodies that I liked. Well, there was a guitar player there. And he played the guitar, and he heard me, and we talked, and he showed me chord structure on the piano. So the second thing that happened to me is that I learned to play the piano, by, by some definition, uh, while on third shift at Shaw Air Force Base. That led to four other guys that I met. They were guitar player, bass player, drummer, and an outstanding singer, and we formed a band in South Carolina. While I was there for two years, we played three nights a week on a club outside the base, making 15 to 20 bucks a piece a night, living like kings. I had one year to go in the service, and I was transferred up to Pease Air Force Base, New Hampshire. And this was to lead to the third thing. First thing was electronic school. The second thing 
was my learning to play the piano. If I remember right, I had about three months before my discharge. And during that time, my roommate left, uh, I think he was transferred, and into my room came an interesting fellow. He was a sergeant. Uh, he worked in the maintenance pool somewhere, but I don't remember where. And he was a strange fellow. He didn't say much. But he was hardly ever there, and when he was, he was busy, usually reading. And we would get into discussions, tentative at first. And then one time, one night, as he was reading something, we were involved in a discussion. I don't remember what the subject was. Probably some inanity that I raised about what the Air Force was doing that didn't appeal to me or something like that. And out of frustration, he opened the, uh, the drawer beside his bed, picked out a copy of a book, and literally threw it at me, totally telling me that I ought to read this. And he said, who knows, you might even like it. And it turned out to be a copy of Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, if you don't know. Now, in my brief high school career, I had read but two books. One I didn't finish, because I hated it. And House of Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne. The other one I did enjoy, and I did finish it, but those were the only two books that I had read at 20 years old in the Air Force. And he threw me this thick, small print book. Well, Bill was his name. I don't remember his last name. Bill was a, a sergeant in the Air Force, but in his spare time he was a commercial diver in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And he dove in the evenings and on weekends for both the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the local fishermen. And I had built up a very fine respect for Bill, even though I didn't know him that well, and only for a short period of time. So when he threw me that book, it had some capital with it in my mind. So I opened the page. Who is John Gall? In the dimming light, Eddie Willis could not see his face, the bum's face. And I began to read it. I can't remember when. Maybe page 100, maybe 150, whatever. I couldn't put it down. I didn't know why I loved this song so much, but I couldn't put it down. And I finished it. Well, by the time I finished it, Bill, who was about to be discharged, was discharged, and he was no longer there. He was there long enough to know that I loved the book, because I wouldn't put it down. And I told him I loved it. Well, I finished it, and I was turned on, I was on fire, but there were other things pressing. I was about to be discharged. The other four guys in the band were waiting for me down in Sumter, South Carolina. So I got on a train and got off it at 4 o'clock in the morning in Sumter, South Carolina, with $8 and a footlocker of my clothes. And we went to Atlanta and played on the road for three years, almost three years. Two, a little over two years, as musicians playing rock and blues. It was a fine time, exciting, and I had in the back of my mind the story of Atlas Shrugged, but I was preoccupied with being a musician and earning a living, which I earned a good living at that time, by the way. Interesting time. Well, one thing led to another, and I decided that this was not for me. Even though I loved music, this was not for me. I needed to do something different. So I announced to the guys that I was, I was leaving, going to go back to Atlanta. I had gotten married during that time to a nice gal. Um, we had a place in Atlanta that we rented. So I returned to Atlanta and opened the paper. And there in the paper was an ad by IBM. IBM, customer engineers needed. 
experience preferred, must have knowledge in mechanics and electronics. So I applied, took the test, they hired me. Interesting side note, I had just gotten back from four weeks at Clearwater, Florida. I had my beard, and the manager that hired me says, well, you're hired under one condition, you've got to shave this beard off. So I did, I said I would do that. So I came to work on that following Monday with a tan all over except for white streaks right <laughs> <laughs> Once getting settled into IBM, I picked up Atlas Shrugged again and read it again. And it, it rekindled that fire that I had experienced at 20 years old in my last year in the Air Force. But it did more than that. Because now, the only thing occupying my mind was IBM, which was a steady 9 to 5 job with a good salary. I didn't have to worry about where we were going to go next and what the pay was and whether one of the guys didn't want to go there or another guy didn't want to go there, whatever. And so what I did, I said, I need to read more of what she wrote. So I picked up a copy of The Fountain. Now, those of you that are familiar with The Fountainhead, you know that it's basically a story of four characters. A hero, a villain, and then people in between. The corrupt, but unknowingly corrupt, business executive, and the second-hander. Those four characters comprise the book. As I began The fountain or Fountainhead, Howard Rourke laughed. Rand always got you with the opening line. And I started into the fountainhead. I experienced the same thing I experienced with Atlas Shrugged. But as I continued to read, that excitement waned. It began, it, it began to be accompanied by unsettling emotions and thoughts. And I finished it. But it was a chore to finish. Because I was no longer excited nor optimistic. Because what had happened during that book, and the thought occurred to me somewhere toward the end, I can't say when, I recognized that while I professed to admire Howard Rourke, the hero, I emotionally identified more with the second hander, Peter Tiedy. And it was a terrible, terrible state I was in. The 70s were characterized in my life by my desire to untangle that conflict. Because while I said that this was who I was, this was really who I was. And I didn't like it. And the only way I knew to deal with it was what Rand had taught me. You need to do something about it. You need to decide with reason as your guideline. Now, I didn't know all that then. It was right there in plain sight. But I didn't know that. So the 70s were punctuated by the disillusion of my marriage, an unsatisfying career in IBM, even though I was making good money, friends that were no longer friends, and meeting people that I, I really didn't feel confident to be a friend to. I had discovered in the fountainhead that my self-esteem to all outward appearances was really, wow, Dave, that wasn't the case. I was really, I really had no self-esteem. It was the product of other people and their assessment of me. Now, the 70s are filled with all kinds of stuff. Like I said, my divorce, my career, 
I met Rand in 76, flew to the Ford Hall Forum, met her while I was there. I spoke with Brandon. More importantly, I read Brandon's book. When the split came between Rand and Brandon, for some reason, all of my objectivist friends, they felt like they had to choose between the Brandon and Rand. Take a side. And of course, most of them took Rand side. Okay? I didn't feel like I had to take a side because Brandon had taught me something. And this is one of the points I want to, I want to make tonight that is so important. The thing that he taught me was that emotions are messengers. When you get an emotion, it's something that you put there. You put it there by what you chose to think about or not think about. And I, I identified with that because I could began to identify my emotions and why they came. To this day, the only one that I can't recognize is why I developed that contempt for authority early on. I've examined it, and I cannot come up with the specific things in my young life that, that triggered that. Spain. Pardon? Spain. <laughs> so Brandon had taught me that. And the 70s was a struggle to get, a, get on top of who I was and why I was what I was and what I wanted to be. Now, 1978 came around. I was, I was still doing well, apparently, at IBM, and I got a promotion. And the promotion was to leave the field and come to Boulder for engineering, uh, to work for the engineering group. I wasn't an engineer. Well, I took that opportunity. Uh, my marriage was in the process of dissolving. By the way, I identified why I married the girl that I married when I did. It was because I knew my parents would love her. But it took an excruciating amount of self-examination to figure that out. But I did. And it was good. She was a good gal. I have nothing bad to say about her. Um, I understand why we were married, but we married for the wrong reasons. But that was just one realization. I arrived in Boulder in 78. It was in part to get away from the past. So by 78, my first quarter of life had been a disaster, but it completed the Air Force. The second quarter was just excruciating for me. I, I title it uh, Discovery, Disillusionment, and Determination. Well, I had realized that I was unfulfilled at IBM. And I needed to do something differently. Now, it just so happened that, that at that time, IBM was discovering, among other things, that their God-given 80% gross profit on, on CPUs and software, or whatever that gross profit was from that incredible lease inventory, was not God-given. That they were competitors. And IBM was going to have to change the way its bureaucracy had evolved because of that lucrative business line of computers and software. So what the CE, the chairman of the board, I mean, John Opel was the chairman of the board at the time, he had sent out a message to all employees soliciting their input and feedback on how IBM was going to transform itself from what it was to what it needed to be to successfully compete in the 80s. So, presumptuous and arrogant me, I sat down and penned what amounted to a 12-page letter to John Opel, and I copied all the board of directors on it, and sent it off. I didn't tell my manager, my second level, or anyone that I was doing this. Well, my second level got a, a response from corporate from John Opel's office, that uh, someone representing him and the VP of the division we were in would be coming to Boulder and they wanted to meet with me. Now, someone in the audience here, Bob Armstrong, which I'm glad you came, I had met Bob at a party, oh, a year or two earlier. 
Bob was the, uh, at the time, he was the uh, controller for the Boulder plant. And we had talked and, and, you know, gotten to know each other briefly, how you do at a party or whatever. Well, we had the meeting in the, in the uh, plant manager's conference room when the vice president and John Opel's staff guy came in, and we went through my letter. And my response was, is these guys were just checking a box for procedures. I was just some schmuck way down in the, in the, in the organization who might have had some interesting things to say and the way to say it, but they had better things to do. But they had to check this box. Well, as I walked out of the conference room, I don't know if you remember this, Bob, but you were sitting there on the, on the couch waiting to go in to see, I guess, the VP there. And Bob says, Dave, what's going on? And so I just handed Bob a copy of my letter and then left. Well, Bob contacted me after reading it and asked if I'd like to come to work for him. Now, I had decided at that time that I would leave IBM. I didn't know what I would do. But I would think of something, like Moonwatcher in 2001. So I was prepared to leave. Now Bob came out of the blue and offered me a possibility of a new position, completely different career path. Bob was a finance guy. I didn't know anything about finance except two and two is four. And he made a set of conditions that I had to meet, and if I would, He'd given me a position in his organization. So after thinking about it and not wanting to throw away what had amounted to by that time of, of 12 to 14 years of, of service in IBM, making a good salary, I accepted it. And the rest is history. Bob's influence, uh, his perseverance, his example, I absorbed like a sponge. Not easily all the times, I might add. During that time, which was the 80s, I started my own business. Two of them, actually. The first one failed, but the second one took off. Uh, I, I had a partner in the business. We made a good bit of money in real estate. We managed rental property. We bought, we sold. She had a broker's license. I had the, the income stream. It was at a time when you could go buy a, a home from HUD and simply bid on it. If you won the bid, HUD would pay a 6% real estate commission. The loan was 5%. We'd walk away from closing with title and cash. All you had to do was rent it. It was easy in Boulder in the 80s to rent. So we did well. All the while, I'm untangling what I had been with what I wanted to be. Fast forward. 92 came around. That's too fast. Late 80s. <laughs> late 80s, I met my current wife. Um, I'm in love with her to this day. And... We don't always agree, but we know where we don't agree, and that's okay. We talk about it, sometimes beneficially, sometimes not so beneficially. <laughs> um, she had a five, four-year-old daughter when I met her, and she's sitting here today, Jessie, and I can tell you, that between Jesse and Julie, I could not be more pleased with how my life has evolved and turned out. Such that at 73, I have retired from IBM, which I did in 1992, ran my business for a number of years, uh, worked, went to work for a couple of startups, 
one I consulted with for a good long time. I began Walden's Gulch in Ella J, Georgia, those of you that are familiar with Atlas Shrugged. It's, like I say, 95% done with 50% to go. <laughs> and T Jess and uh, Tony have been there, so has Bob. A couple of other people have been here and not here tonight. And I have learned so much that Rand and then Brandon triggered in me that I want to conclude this speech with a focus on not them, their ideas. If there's two things that I have learned that are most important in my life that I would urge everyone to consider, it's these. One's external, one's internal. The external thing, no, the internal, let's do the internal first. The internal thing is, is that each of us, while we may not be able to totally control what happens to us in life, we can always control what our response to it will be. We are in control of that, inevitably. And that is freeing. It takes your focus to you and not them. That's one of the things that I have learned. The other thing, the external thing, despite what has been happening to our wonderful country, particularly in the last hundred years, and most noticeably in the last 50 or so, when it comes to security, comfort, convenience, opportunity, safety, and the rewards that come from rationally seizing opportunity, each of us is living in the best of times, in the best of places. And when you lose sight of that over whatever the, the issue of the day is, it tends to distort and render that perspective less than it should be. So those two things. Now, I want to conclude with Rand herself. Like I said, I met her once. We talked briefly. Ayn Rand was human like the rest of us. And as such, her ability to rationalize, to make errors when she thinks, she, when she thought she was not, to make decisions, not based on what she said, but on other things, like the rest of us, she could do as well. So she was human. She's like Jefferson. He had slaves. He also had a thing for Sally Hemmings, apparently. So what? It doesn't take away from his ideas. Ideas that he lived and for which we benefit. In my mind, Ayn Rand was a genius. Nothing less than a genius. Now why do I say that? Well, I compare her to Isaac Newton. And I do so for the following reason. Newton had a vision of the way the world worked. Planets, gravity, motion. He articulated that vision in a series of, of ideas that have become Newton's laws of motion. Now, if that wasn't enough, he then devised or invented the calculus to demonstrate them. That we use, that, that science uses day in and day out. 
Well, Rand had a vision. And she articulated that vision in a series of fictional novels. One of which is 1,100 pages long. The subject is philosophy. And it's the sec it sold almost 15 million copies since it's been published. It's been cited as the second most influential book that the, the, the survey people had ever read. She articulated that vision in those novels. And if that wasn't enough, she then discovered or invented, your choice, the philosophy of objectivism to demonstrate that vision. And that's why I put her in the same category as people like Isaac Newton. I want to close with a with a question I'm awful at, often asked and and which many of you probably ask yourselves or others because it's part of the libertarian psyche. And that is this. Why is it that after the 20th century, with the publication of such incredible work by Ayn Rand, Rothbard, and others, 60 years after Atlas Shrugged, the libertarian political movement is so impotent. And I believe, at least this is my answer to that, and for those of you in the audience who are objectivists, and call yourself objectivists like I do, I, I particularly address this to you. Craig Biddle, I, I don't know if you know Craig. Craig publishes the Objective Standard. Uh, objective Standard? I think that's what it is. Um, we've exchanged a couple of emails. And one of the words he uses to describe many objectivists is insufferable. <laughs> Well, I was part of that. So were most of the young objectivists that I met. Judgmental, condescending, critical, moralizing, incessantly obnoxious. My advice to everyone, objectivists or not, but particularly to objectivists, is to lead with your life, by example, not with your mouth. Now, if you've got to lead with your mouth, because you can't with your life, the situation doesn't allow you to do that, then know your audience. The dominant philosophy in this wonderful country bequeathed to us by our founders is the Judeo-Christian philosophy. That's a fact. You may stomp your foot and say it shouldn't be. That's silly. Whatever. If you do so, what do you think your effect on those Judeo-Christians are going to be? Is going to be? It's not going to be very effective. So my answer to that question, why, is has libertarian politics led by objectivists and others been seemingly so impotent is because, in my case, Rand and we objectivists have been our own worst enemy. You've got to know your audience, respect the fact of what they believe, whether you agree with or not, and unlike Rand, act in a manner that draws them to you not pushes them away. And I can say that if I had to sum up my last half of my uh, football game, as I hopefully head for overtime and then sudden, <laughs> and then sudden death, <laughs> um, that's the message that I would, I would like to leave you with. And I, and I am arrogant enough or presumptive enough to say that that reflects my life and has for the last part of this last half of the fourth quarter. Anyway, thank you. Questions and answers.
Thank you.